good afternoon to those uh, across the region and uh, depending on where you are, it could be good, uh, good morning, good evening. Uh, thanks for joining us. This is uh, the East African Law Society webinar uh, organized by the Sports Law Cluster. And today we'll be looking at esports and um, basically exploring the, the challenges that are there and then trying to explore also the opportunities that are there and uh, see uh, how we can Ghana or synergize to get the best out of it for the benefit, not only of the region, but also of the global sports industry. My name is uh, Timothy Kaja. I'm an associate at uh, KTA. I am um, a sports lawyer. I'm also an advocate of the High Court of Uganda, member of the East African Law Society. I'm also a lecturer at Chambogo University and um, a director at Discovery Sports. I'm uh, glad to be your moderator for today. With me, I have uh, two distinguished panelists. Um, firstly, we have um, Mr. Andrew Luca, who's uh, an advocate working with uh, Moeman Company, Company Advocates and Solicitors. He has a bachelor's degree from Ghana Christian University, a postgraduate diploma in law from the Law Development uh, Center in Uganda. Oluka is a versatile legal uh, practitioner. He has keen interest in uh, commercial practice, especially in the areas of commercial arbitration, litigation, advisory, and intellectual property rights. He has acted for a variety of clients, including Total, Bukola on uh, IPR protection, have a styling group of companies, Zuko TV, Simba Group on matters of uh, commercial arbitration and uh, adjudication. Uh, when um, out of out, out of out of uh, the education, when he puts his ties down, he enjoys playing soccer, swimming, and a little bit of boxing. Uh, I know our chairman will be will take an interest of this boxing. It could be an opportunity for for the uh, for him to recruit another boxer onto the Ugandan scene. Yes, so we are glad to have you with us, Andrew. Thank you very much, Timothy. I'm glad to be a part of this. Um, on top of what you've said about myself, please add he's a sports enthusiast. <laughs> okay, yeah. without doubt, he's a sports enthusiast. That's why he's here, and today he will be help, helping us to dissect esports to explore the opportunities and challenges that it presents. Our second panelist is. Um, Our second panelist is, is uh, Mr. Peter Mshkliwa Mukandi. He's an advocate um, in practicing in Tanzania. He's the managing partner at um, Blue Strategic Attorneys in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, since uh, uh, in the year 2021. Peter, Peter has attended the, or attained the Global Masters International Sports from East Day last year. He also has an advanced international taxation uh, chartered by the, uh, by the, from the Chartered Institute of Taxation in the UK. He has a postgraduate diploma in taxation from the Institute of Tax Administration. He also has a bachelor's degree in law from uh, Tumaini University in Dar es Salaam. He has worked on uh, a number of corporate matters and uh, sports, advised clients in a range of uh, sports facets that include uh, tax, corporate governance, uh, mergers and, acqu and acquisitions, securities, regulations, regulations, contracts, and uh, compliance issues. He has drafted complex uh, commercial agreements, uh, conducted thorough legal uh, research and analysis to provide accurate and well-reasoned legal opinions. It's good to have you here, Peter. Peter? Okay, Peter might still be having a few glitches here and there. And there. Oh, we have him now. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Peter. Though it's a, your voice is a bit low, yeah, so you can I... try to amplify that. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but you can... can go on. Yeah, it is a pleasure being on the board as a speaker and uh, being a, a lawyer and a passionate in sports and uh, basically with esports. So I'm a pleasure to be part of the panel. We are very happy to have you, to have you here, Peter. 
Africa. Thank yes, you. Yes, and now to help us do the introduction and also further uh, welcome our panelists and, uh, and attendees, we have um, uh, on the panel our chairman of the sports cluster, the East African Law Society, uh, Philip Munavi, please do the honors. Thank you. Thank you, FIFA agent and advocate Timothy Kaja. I know you're one of the new members on the list of uh, agents. Uh, I thank all the members who are in attendance. I'm Philip Munavi. I am the chairperson of the Sports Law Cluster or Committee of ELS. I am happy to see that uh, we are having successive sessions and the attendance is increasing per session. Uh, we have covered a number of topics, opportunities in sports law. We've uh, had different sessions, uh, but in the end, we are looking at having a sports law summit, which we shall plan to organize at the AGM. That is in Burundi. It will be the first of its kind. But uh, it's, not, it's not a one committee effort. Uh, several people are coming up with initiatives that are aimed at building this sector of practice. I know Vinari advocates will be preparing uh, their second, they'll be organizing their second uh, sports law conference in Tanzania. It is on the 13th and 14th of uh, July, that's next month. I'll be opportune to, to be one of the panelists on the panel session uh, so that we can spread more the gospel of sports law practice uh, on call. I want to honor the presence of uh, senior advocate Kavumaka Venge, if he's the one I've seen on call. Uh, he has a rich history in the sports sector. I know currently, I think he has put up uh, the first, uh, the first, what? He has a very huge property around uh, uh, Botambala Madu side. I've seen it's a race, it's, it's a race track if I'm not mistaken. I've seen seasoned, uh, seasoned uh, sports, sports uh, journalist, Leon Senyange. He has covered uh, sports with the uh, biggest media houses. He gave me an interview on BBC some time back. So I was really honored. I see him on call. So this effort is one that we are pushing forward. Today's topic is on uh, e-sports. Uh, and uh, when the flyers came out, people have been asking me, but now you people are promoting uh, gambling, ETC. So I was like, no, tune in and understand the difference between esports and uh, gambling. Right now I'm in Kenya. I'm actually at the Law Society of Kenya. I'm within the, their boardroom. And I'll tell you that Kenya has embraced this part of, uh, of sports so much that we all know it contributes to about uh, the last, I think the 2022 PWC Africa Media and uh, Entertainment Report indicates that it, it, uh, Kenya obtained about uh, $38 million in revenue from esports. Uh, so the panelists will be shedding more light on what is within esports. Is it only the gaming part? Is it the, because you see there's, the gaming part where people have been buried so much into the gaming aspect of it and games like Mortal Kombat among others. Then there's the sports part, which uh, has like FIFA series. I know there's a, there's a FIFA, e FIFA World Cup that is coming up, uh, but you see Kenya took it on at an early stage and they have developed it so much that they hold different tournaments, including world-class tournaments. Uh, this year alone, Kenya has already qualified two people, Leon Memphis and Bunny Minor, who are going to participate in the, in the World Cup FENS tournament this year. So you see that they, are, they, are taking on, they have taken it on early. It's a multi-million dollar industry. So we bring these sessions to see that how do lawyers tap in? When you look at the sport, when you do research on it, you see there are so many opportunities from costume, uh, graphics, in all these 
areas, lawyers can have an opportunity to tap in and understand. Uh, people who took on this sport at an early stage and have made world class names, more so here in Kenya, include people like Sylvia Githoni, who is a law student, by the way. Uh, by daytime, she's a law student. By nighttime, she's a, she's, a, she's a professional gamer. She goes by the name of Queen Arrow. You can follow her for those who would be interested. Then we have Brian, Brian uh, Dianga. He's also Kenyan. Uh, he comes from one of the biggest slums here in Kenya, uh, Kibera. Uh, these are people who have taken on the game to a professional level. They are participating in each tournament that comes. They have qualified for major events. Uh, this year alone, we have several events coming up, uh, like uh, Singapore will be having uh, a world tournament in esports and gaming. Uh, so we need to understand, and our participants need to understand how to get into this game. For instance, Senior Council Kavuma Kavenge, on his property, he has a race course uh, uh, along Madu, around Madu there. On his race course, he can put a session or a department or he can demarket space for e-sports, e which can help people participate, knowing that they're into a professional sport, not only gambling, not gambling as people are mistaking it to be. Um, I think that is the brief I can share. I'll be chipping in as the moderator said, uh, but we are here to learn from each other. There could be a participant who is a gamer. Please feel free to share your experience. There could be, there could be another participant, a lawyer or journalist who has tried to follow up on this sport. Please feel free to join us. We have made the sports law sessions too interactive as the sport, as the sports itself is too interactive. The previous sessions have been so interactive. So I look forward for a very wonderful session. Uh, and we are willing to learn. Uh, one of our participants, as he has been moderated as a panelist, sorry, as he has been introduced, he took on a master's in sports law. And his major interest is in esports. So you see how wonderful the, the sport is taking shape. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Philip. Talking about um, Miss Livia Gathoni, uh, it's reported by Munich um, that she, she, she was the first professional esports player in the region. And uh, you might want to look up and see how much money that she collected by the end of the year 2021. That, is, that was when we were at the height of COVID. And uh, many of these esports had a boom because then um, the physical sports could not actually happen happen uh, as 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 fast as we thought that it could be so by then Sylvia was already re uh, ranked or uh, seated as a professional esports player and oh my word if you look at the figures of what she collected in 2021 will when the world was gripping with covid she was in her own world but that said let us uh, call in peter to just give us a brief of um, what is it all about what is this about uh, when they say esports what does it mean is it man and machine? Is it man and man on machine? And why would the lawyer be interested for starters? Philip, uh, Peter, sorry, Peter, please help us uh, uh, do that breakdown for starters, and then we can deep down in what happened, what's happening in uh, Tanzania. Yeah, thank you very much for for this opportunity, at least to, to give a glimpse of what eSport is. Uh, as what uh, Philip has said, there have been a lot of confusion when it comes to, to, <coughs> to, to eSports. Some confuse it as uh, with gambling and uh, some go beyond to think that maybe it's just like uh, someone playing maybe with cards or with uh, uh, the, for, for, for maybe for luck and uh, some of the sort. But eSport is an umbrella of gaming. Uh, 
uh, it, 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 it becomes different with, with, with gaming in terms of uh, competition, that you need to have players who are competing, uh, whether it is for money or whether it is for, for a certain price. So uh, esports traced back in the early 1980, uh, where people now uh, 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 were looking to to how to 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 to, uh, to play games and whatever, but in a, a competitive manner. So uh, looking at uh, the sport globally. Uh, Germany has been a pioneer uh, for, for esports, and uh, I was lucky also to be uh, taught by one of the guru in esports, Prof. Napiok, uh, who is also uh, one of the, 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 the prominent lawyer in terms of esports. So, by, 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 by simply uh, uh, e-sport is gaming, but in a competitive manner, and uh, uh, the, 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 the impact which has uh, created as we speak today uh, with regards to COVID, as you have, you, have, you have said, it is huge, and I can say the opportunities are elephant. Uh, so briefly, uh, eSport is is uh, gaming under the umbrella, but it is in a competitive manner where you have players who plays for prize and for money. Now, maybe if I go uh, to, to 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 legal framework uh, with experience from Tanzania. Uh, in Tanzania, uh, e-sport is uh, overseen by the government. And uh, we have a gaming board of Tanzania, uh, which regulate e-sport activities and the uh, gaming at large. And uh, if you go through the, 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 the Gaming Act, uh, Section 4, which mandates the gaming board uh, to regulate uh, all operation and the management of esports in Tanzania. Uh, we have also some some other laws, uh, including uh, uh, the the regulation, including the the gaming regulation, the gaming equipment standard, smart interface uh, for gaming machine. Uh, as you understand, with esports, sometimes uh, you need to have a machine to, to operate and the, in the, in the play. Uh, the, the, the gaming board, uh, as I've, 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 I've talked about it, it regulates and it also uh, give registration for, for, for esports licenses. Uh, for those who for those who are interested maybe to a uh, competition and uh, some of the kind and uh, it also have uh, uh, mandated to uh, not only to give a uh, uh, license but also to to give post registration for for any gamers or esport players uh, before any player, but it also looks on the on the on the illegal uh, operations, uh, uh, which is also mandated to to deter any activities which are contrary with the gaming act. Uh, uh, that is all about uh, uh, legal framework. Now coming to 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 to, to the status of esports, as I can say, uh, from from the experience of Tanzania, uh, it is still very narrow, and uh, you find very few people who are very who are conversant with esports, and uh, I can say because uh, it is a new phenomenon, but uh, 
there are a lot of challenges which are, which also inhibit, which we shall discuss later. But what I can say, uh, looking at the the, the 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 magnitude or the 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 the, the, the sector itself, it is typically very narrow, and uh, it is high high time now for for us who have been. Uh, with you some 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 details and the uh, and the uh, and the uh, and the experience in a legal perspective now to to motivate people to join in in esports. Talking about Kenya, I have my colleague who are also practicing and uh, some are uh, professional players from Kenya. It's a bit uh, 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 promising and uh, increasing day after day. But for Tanzania, as I can say, is very narrow. And uh, looking at the 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 the, the, the legal framework, uh, what I can say if you go through our laws, uh, they are they are they are they are not that much uh, they are very French the extent that they give a very good room for, for professional players, and they also stakeholders who can chip in and they, and they, and they, and they work and they, uh, operate uh, esports in Tanzania. But as I said, uh, we have very few players, and some play for leisure, which does not even qualify to be esports. Uh, so we still uh, navigate on how to motivate and they encourage uh, this young uh, young uh, youth and uh, uh, who are also uh, in a, in a, uh, who are also very uh, positive to to come and chip in to to eSports. so for for now what i can say as uh, uh, we are still struggling to motivate so it is a motivation kind of uh, bringing people to 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 esport but in a, in, a, in a nutshell what i can uh, i can say uh, the the room is still very uh, small and uh, a lot has to be done uh, with illegal framework i have no I have no problem uh, they are very much friendly and uh, they give us opportunities for those who are interested to come and uh, be part of it. So that is for, for now. All right, many thanks for that. Many thanks for that. Now I want to bring in Andrew Luca to tell us uh, what does it look like uh, in the Pearl of Africa and possibly uh, now uh, crossing over to, to the biggest economy in the region. What does it look like? Do they have anything uh, that is as is in Tanzania or they have nothing and uh, what what is it like there why are people doing business there want to tell us uh, why is it that these things are only stronger in Kenya is the government they are more tolerant what does it look like uh, from the Paul to Nairobi Andrew uh, thank you very much uh, Timothy I hope I'm audible enough I my internet. I don't know whether it's just mine. It seems to be a bit shaky. Timothy, please come yeah, audible. I'm audible okay. Thank yes, you you're very audible. much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that that insightful uh, brief on uh, esport in Tanzania. Um, I. I, I, and it's very difficult to follow up on, on what you said because of uh, uh, starting with the regulatory framework in Uganda, in terms of regulating e-sport, uh, so far we have nothing specifically that targets e-sport. Um, but for me, that is not a deterrent uh, because the closest we have to something that regulates um, that would, the closest we would have to something with the, to our law to regulate esport would be the National Gaming and Lotteries, Lotteries Act, which is not very specific towards uh, esport, 
and concentrating more on the gambling aspect of, 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 of gaming. However, that shouldn't stop because um, that shouldn't stop anyone interested in um, having a go at esports. Because once you look at um, when you look at the other available laws, for instance, esports is really anchored on on contracts, and we have a very robust contract act, which allows you then to enter all sorts of engagements and agreements with uh, potential. So for me, there is still a leg to stand on, even if we do not have a, a law specifically covering e-sport. Um, under the contracts, you can do so many other things. Upload, then you would have issue, however, where you can latch on to to. to to, to engage in e-sport. And again, in similar story to what is happening in, in Tanzania, in Uganda as well, there is not so much vibrance of e-sport. In fact, in my sport, sport sense with their stick nature, I've only come across, I think it is called next level experience, who are organizing some sort of a racing, um, who have a racing calendar akin to Formula One. Uh, they have teams, I think so far they have eight teams that participate. You, I think each team has two drivers and then guys race uh, for prize money of about a million shillings. So you can see it is not yet as vibrant as, as, as for instance, in the Western world, in places like China, the USA, Canada, Korea, where literally people are making lots and lots of money out of esports. And I'm glad to hear that in Kenya, uh, people are already making miles uh, in, in developing the esports sector. Uh, hopefully, after this webinar, so many of us will get interested in exploring aspects of esports, and uh, those those of us who are who are who are from Uganda and even the region, we can come in and try and establish some of these things in, 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 in where possible. Because, um, like like it is said in others in in other aspects of life, eh, uh, technology is going to be the way the way of life. And esport as probably could never have had a blessing better than uh, COVID, because COVID then gravitated all of us to places where we could enjoy our passions within limitations, and that's exactly where esport has thrived. Timothy, yes, uh, thank you, Andrew, for that. Now, we, uh, from both panelists, we hear this, so that um, maybe using, uh, you, you seem to describe a narrow space. And uh, from the West, like you said, we know that um, in countries uh, or globally, the economy, if you, see, if you look at uh, the Bloomberg reports as early as uh, 2021, they are projecting that uh, this is an industry valued in the excess of 1 billion US dollars and growing at about 15.7% as early as 2021. That was at the, as the world was uh, seeing of COVID during the height of it. So if we've had no laws from you that, that are barring anyone from doing this, what are the challenges in this part of the world that we are not getting right for us to be uh, actively anchored into this industry and to try to get whatever we can, or at least a piece of that cake that is uh, now projected to be uh, at about 1.5, if you go by the growth rate from uh, 2021. Uh, Timothy, maybe let me go first. Um, for starters, uh, eSport was valued at about 3.2 billion US dollars in 2022 in terms of revenue. Okay. Uh, but uh, if you dug deeper, I can assure you almost 99% of that is outside of uh, the East African region. I'll, I'll, I'll cite the example of Uganda, uh, which is where I am more relatable to. 
Uh, some of the challenges facing the growth of esports, for instance, in Uganda, come down to things like accessibility to, for instance, a computer. Uh, as much as in the Western world, a computer is an, a necessity and an essential in, 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 everyone, in everyday life, not so many are lucky to be able to access computers. And then there is the issues of internet challenges. Um, to be able to fully enjoy and explore um, esports as 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 a, as a business, you need stable internet. And 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 you and I, Timothy and Philip plus I, will attest to the fact that uh, this is one of the areas that we struggle. Uh, of course, um, societal acceptance of of esports as a business. Uh, for the longest time, sport has been looked at as a hobby, as a pastime, and things like that. So it will take a bit of a, a, a mindset change from society to accept that someone can actually earn a living by playing video games, for lack of a better word. Those are some of the challenges um, that I see hindering the growth of esport in Uganda. But of course, as a lawyer, again, uh, not so many are... Uh, not so many are well conversant with esport or even understand uh, some of the legal opportunities that are available and i'm glad we're having this webinar today because hopefully among us the five of us who are who are actively contributing to this we can be able to open up the eyes of our brothers and sisters out there to enlighten them on the may on, on on the big big opportunities that are available in terms of esport. Timothy, I see Philip's hand up. Maybe let me surrender the mic to Philip to chip in. All right, Philip. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, if uh, I may contribute on that point, if you look at the history of gaming in Kenya, uh, there is the spirit to play the game, the sports, but there is also the spirit of innovativeness. As early as 2007, Kenya had developed its first game. That is uh, Adventures of uh, Nyangi, if I may remember. Uh, then 2015, they had uh, Nairobi X, uh, which was uh, 3D ultimately. So you see that there is too much innovativeness that is involved in the gamers themselves. Uh, Timothy, you work with a firm that has advised on the, on the Janzi instrument. Uh, now, this is where we need to look as lawyers who have interest in this, in this space. You know a gamer, you, uh, you just need to take this person on, see where he is interested, uh, see if you can help him uh, do an advisory role on... Uh, how he makes contracts, how he registers entities, how he puts together his, his art to make sure that he has something that he can put on market. The advantage about you know, local innovation is like uh, Nairobi X. If a, game is, uh, if a game is called Nairobi X, you'll find that most people in that area will need to go into it. If we came up with Kampala X, so the gamers in Kampala would get the spirit to participate and see that they get the numbers to make it very competitive. So as lawyers, we need to look into these gamers or into this field and see where we can come in and help on things like IP, contract law, as my brother said, ETC. So we can help uplift the spirit. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Philip. Um... Peter, anything to add on the challenges uh, from the uh, Tanzanian perspective, please? Yeah, yeah. What, what I can add, the challenge has always been common. Uh, you talk even to, to, to a gamer, the challenge will always be the same. Uh, but we need to, to impart the spirit. Whenever there is challenges, uh, there must be some solutions. Uh, and uh, looking at the infrastructure, which is always the common, uh, the common challenge, uh, lack of infrastructure for gamers, uh, the, the lack of uh, accessibility, which is internet accessibility. But what I've, uh, I've uh, 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 
are more pined whenever there are this challenge because they are very common and we know we are Africans, we live in Africa and uh, this is a very big opportunity uh, which we should have to go beyond from whatever we, we, we face uh, given the challenges. But we, we need to know that there are a lot of opportunities out of this challenge. And uh, as what Philip has said, uh, with eSport, as I, as, as I spoke earlier, it is an elephant. Uh, you just need to have a gamer, uh, just uh, give him some, some, some ABC on eSports, and uh, you are good to go. So for me, what I see from the challenges uh, they are common, and uh, we might even spend uh, the whole day uh, discussing the challenges because they are very known and they are very common. What we, we, we need to go beyond is now to look on, the, on how to face the challenges, but at least to look on the opportunities which are vibrant and which are uh, at our disposal. And uh, for we lawyers who are, who are, who are have passion who are interested to be part of esports it is now right time for, for us uh, looking at the challenge but also to look on the wide opportunities which are at our disposal because uh, have been uh, have been involved in a, a contract for some of the players football players uh, where you, you need a lot. Uh, I know you are now a, a new agent. Uh, uh, when looking at a representation uh, contract, uh, someone who has uh, maybe had a player from uh, his academy, uh, maybe after academy, then he goes to, 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 a, to a professional club. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very long process which is involved uh, in between. But for eSport, uh, the, the, the time which is involved, looking at the gamer, uh, giving him ABC, uh, going through the contract, uh, you can see the, the, the time limit. I mean, the, the time which is involved is very narrow, and sometimes it cannot, uh, 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 sometimes it, uh, uh, it cannot give you a, a room where you can spend a lot because you meet uh, the game at the point. When you give him the, 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 the ABC of eSport, then the next day he plays and they become a professional player. So for me, what I see, there are abundant opportunities which should not be the, 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 which should give us the, the solution, but also the, 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 the challenges uh, should not be the part of the, of the opportunities which are, are, are easily and they are at our disposal. So uh, the challenges, as I said, they are very common. And uh, being, the, being them common, uh, we need to rethink and go beyond. Uh, given the fact that the opportunities are abundant. Uh, that's all. All right. Uh, thanks for that, Peter. Peter, you mentioned two things. Uh, you raise up the, uh, the contract bit and then the opportunities. But let us first uh, begin at, by looking at uh, the concerns that uh, these games raise, especially in um, people have raised the concern of um, how whether these games are really addictive onto in the perspective of uh, many many children play these games and then we also know that if you play them for longer hours you have you could have issues with your wrist issues with your eyes issues with your general conduct uh, uh, using contracts and um, bring out these concerns uh, how do we tackle the concerns how do we uh, assist the players uh, of, of esports who may spend long hours before screens and uh, tweaking their wrists of fingers left and center. Do we do this in contract? Because like you said, there is no law that says X should do I. 
So how do we use the contracts to, to curb those concerns? And maybe just, uh, if you also may add, in the same length, we also know that many of these people are individual athletes, while others have created clubs. If you go in, into the West, maybe in Europe, there are clubs of e-gamers. So how, does, how do contracts speak into the concerns that uh, esports raise? And uh, of course, how do, how, do, how do the contracts also speak into how this is run in terms of uh, creating teams and uh, also having standalone athletes? Yes. Yeah, you want yeah. to go first, Peter, and then we can have uh, Phil and Oloka later? Yeah, yeah. Maybe to be, to be precise and very brief, uh, you know, any game is addiction. And, uh, and uh, you cannot uh, uh, come to a point where you can, uh, can uh, uh, differentiate or you can live one and alone uh, when it comes to addiction. Uh, the best thing or the, 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 the issue which should be taken into consideration it is on the issue of professionalism on gamers. Uh, because for me, I'm addicted to, to maybe I'm addicted to cartoons, uh, but I might do it in a, in a leisure way and not in a professional way. So for, for me, what I see, it should have to be uh, drawn into uh, a big picture. Uh, uh, in, a, in a competitive perspective uh, of professionalism in esports or gamers. And uh, when it comes to, to teams and the contract, uh, that's what I was uh, pointing uh, before. Uh, when, when you talk about esports, uh, it has to do with competition. And, and, and the players uh, have to be also professional. Uh, so, if you are a professional player, given the fact that uh, you might have uh, taken a very long time to stay, maybe to, to prepare for, for the match, that does not matter because at the end of the day, uh, everyone is addicted on its own uh, way. So, for me, uh, what I see, we should have to draw the line of uh, uh, demarcation between being a professional gamer and a gamer for leisure. And uh, when it comes now to game for leisure, that addiction issue should be now the, 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 the focal point. But when it comes to profession, it all depends. We know that uh, there are some football players who might not leave the pitch, maybe the, the, uh, the, during the training session. Uh, they might spend the three hours before the, 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 the after the, the hours of training. So it, it, it is all about uh, uh, insistuatic, but at the same time, passion. Uh, so we, we need to, to, to differentiate uh, between a professional gamers and the gamers for leisure. And that is the point where addiction now chip in. When it is for leisure, that I have no doubt might be addiction in some of the thoughts. But when it comes to, to professional gamers uh, uh, for competing, uh, that should also be uh, leave alone from, from addiction. But it, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you need to, to, to make some exercise. Uh, you need to, to, to understand the, the, the rules of the game. So having 10 hours, 12 hours, for me, I don't think if that could, uh, could amount to addiction, if at all you are preparing for the game. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for sharing on that, Peter. We have, we are going to have uh, the legal officer, the Federation of Uganda Football Association. That is the body heading football in Uganda, who have just completed the successful uh, football season. Uh, maybe you could have uh, something to share with us on what we've discussed so far. Please, Dennis, uh, feel free to share with us. Uh, thank you so much, Timo, and the, the panel. I wanted to add a few things from my land friend, what Oluka added. Yes, in Uganda, we don't have a very clear legislative framework, but uh, in the recent drafting of the bill, the sports bill, which is yet to be assented to, 
uh, subject to the approval. We tried to consider, I was one of the committees where we tried to consider esports. And the, one of the critical things that came out, because even you look at the schedule that was established at first, esports was missing. One of the critical issues that were raised was esports was categorized in two areas. We, are, we had the amateur side, people playing for Asia, and the bill was not majorly focusing on that. We are looking at the professional side. And professional side meaning, if it's going to be regulated by NCS, it has to have international representation. That's one of the core issues that confused everybody in the meeting. Why? We have, in these federations, in this uh, football or in other sports that we have, boxing, athletics, we always have the representation at, at Af Africa. We do also have a representation on the world, like football is FIFA, uh, when it comes to boxing, we have AIBA, athletics, we all have all other representations where Ugandans will go and compete uh, internationally. Now, when it comes to esports, football, yes, we have the FIFA 23, and it was defined in a way that a group of people, either two players, are going to compete in a, a game, a virtual game, not themselves playing, but virtually playing another game. So it was more where the parliamentarians could not really appreciate at that stage. So we let it go that uh, on the professional side, there are also other requirements of the gamers. For example, have street fighting, or uh, legends, wars, where international people are competing, and there are huge pays as we have agreed, there are advertisements, there are contracts. But how do you now regulate? We don't have international. It's not in boxing, it's not in find that the gamers themselves uh, create a game, the international gamers create a game, and then uh, invite competitors. So basically, they have the right to establish their own rules. So regulating it was a bit tricky at that time because new games are coming up. Uh, when you look at uh, these other games for fighting, which is most of the, uh, the, 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 the famous games, because football, racing, are not so famous in terms of international competitions as far as esport is concerned. So that's how we rested it. Uh, the committee said we need to review further, and even the, the, the requirements that were required by NCS to register that federation. But the good news we have, we have people competing, even in this week, but one, I saw an advert where people go and compete, players go and compete virtually on FIFA 23, basically football and the basketball, players come in and compete. The huge challenge we have for us as lawyers is now how do we take this game internationally? Because competition in Uganda alone may not suffice business, as now if we're talking about law and business. People coming to Lugogo, people aged 20, uh, 18 years to 30, playing around, the winner gets 500, I understand, 500,000, which are like 100 and maybe 10, $20. The lawyer's business now is going to international in terms of representation. So who are we appearing before? Is it the gamer or the international federation? Is it the international boxing or the guy, the, the company that created the game itself? So those are the challenges that we are still we need to review as a legal team. Uh, in, in East Africa and still because competing among ourselves or in East Africa may not have the business that is able to suffice or develop the game to the highest level. The other issue, as we mentioned, there's a game which we're playing. Uh, I was informed that the, by the president, the acting president of the eSports in Uganda, uh, because it's not yet registered, he informed me sometime back that the they were playing, uh, they wanted to play with a team in Morocco and, and the Wataki. These guys are using 5G. By the time the guys are going to score, the other already scored. So the internet was intermittent internet. Ours is still low. So you find that they couldn't compete and everybody has mentioned it. But the critical thing is the regulatory framework we need to look at. Because if you read around, there are sponsorships. You find these gamers, if you look at a football game, a virtual football game. You see pitch boards already, there is Panasonic, there is Sony, there is Hisense, already the guard are going on. And even when you are watching, people are playing those games. 
you find they are watching the adverts of uh, the international companies who are dealing in Mercedes Benz and others. The adverts are there. We are not yet there as Ugandans or in East Africa. I'm not sure about our friends in Kenya. But as I heard from my colleague in Tanzania, there's that loophole that we have not tapped into. And I've seen another business coming in, even in social media. These players, you find the players being fought by uh, 2 million followers on Twitch, these social media apps that like Twitch, where live play always happening and people are following their players. Because normally this game is also moving on players, like the way you see boxing, players participating in those games, adverts and the endorsements there's a lot of business in there that we need to develop our ugandans or east africans to become so famous to be forward and then endorsement comes into play such that now we can also be able to assist them in terms of the digital framework so in my nutshell my conclusion is our gaming here we still have a confusion between the owner of the game is it the international federation as far as legislative framework is concerned or the gamers the guy who creates the games the Twitch and others who create those games, virtual games that are being played, and even the Ugandan law. We could look at contracts if there is endorsements, but we are not yet there. So that's what I can say for now. Over to you, Timon. Thanks a lot, Dennis, for those insights. And uh, you give a very good example of uh, the internet issue that Andrew mentioned earlier on. If you're struggling with 3G and then someone is at 5G, of course, uh, it's hard that you can play uh, together on international uh, competition all at once in different places. But we've had Andrew's up for quite some time. So we'd like to get his in, uh, reactions here before you bring in uh, Philip. And then uh, the rest of our attendees, you can uh, be on set. We are almost also opening up the floor for you to have your input in this. Andrew? Thank you very much, Timothy. I want to react to uh, two things. Uh, for starters, um, contrary to what Dennis is saying about there being confusion as to, as a lawyer, who do you act for? I actually see it as a wider playing uh, playing field for, for you as a lawyer, because you could choose to act for the gamer, you could choose to act for the content creator. You could choose to act for the federation. You could choose to act for the organizers of, 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 of whichever tournament it is. Eh? It's, it's really, really very, very diverse for a lawyer. There are so many tenants that you can get involved into. Uh, on our chat, someone is asking, what are the opportunities available to lawyers? Think, think intellectual property. Every aspect of intellectual property that, that, that you know of is, is, uh, touches, touches um, e-sport from your copyright, from your, to your trademarks, to your uh, trade, uh, trade secrets, all those are oh, the, the entire work. All those are available in 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 esport, including image rights, endorsements, contracts. Those are all available available opportunities for 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 any lawyer out there. There's something that uh, Peter was trying to hint on, I, and I felt it didn't come out clearly. Um, Peter was trying to hint on uh, the cost, the cost requirements of, uh, for instance, getting, developing uh, a gamer. If you look at, and he was relating it to sending uh, someone to a sports academy where maybe you spend three, four years in a sports academy, and then it requires all sorts of things like transportation, what, 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 and the likes. Now, when you look at eSport, developing a gamer seems to be a little bit cheaper because all you need is a computer and availability of games to practice his craft. And then you can play with everyone in whichever corner of the world. You don't have to necessarily ship the guy from here to Russia to go and face a Russian opponent. He can be seated in his living room and he's playing a game against a Russian opponent and in the same way, making money. Those are some of the dynamics that appear to, to skew people towards eSport. Now, of course, um, the fears and 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 um, the fears about esports, things like addiction, things like um, eyesight. Well, we all know every occupation comes with its own hazards. I think it's a case of um, finding finding your balance between how much time you invest in 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 the sport vis-a-vis. -vis the rest of your life uh, because of course the reality is that um 
once you get really immersed in, in all these games, and I'm saying so because at some point, I think I was tending towards um, addiction of, 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 of PlayStations. But once you really get immersed into these games, you don't feel like stopping. But that's the, that's the danger with life. I think just about anything comes with such drawbacks. If, if it's, it's about you to find a balance. And, and therein, when, once you find your balance as to how much time you invest in your training, in your practice, I mean, find any active chess player who is preparing for a tournament, and they will tell you they wake up in the middle of the night dreaming up chess moves. That's how addictive sport can be. But those are some of the, uh, that, that's why those are some of the challenges that could come in. But there's also help. It's not all lost. There's help, there's psychological help. If you've got a proper management team, then they can regulate your hours that you invest in, 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 in practice and training and the hours you need to rest. So when you're looking at an e-sport aspect, picture your everyday normal sport, for instance, football. Look at a gamer as a football player that you've chosen to represent. Whatever that footballer who actually goes to, say, Philip Omondi Stadium and plays football needs is everything your gamer will want. Thank you, Timothy. All right. Thanks a lot, Andrew, for sharing on that. I see also Philip's hand is up, so we can have Philip and maybe also tell us uh, your perspective on whether really uh, this, the, the addiction or the side effects thing is just a fallacy or it's something that uh, you as a lawyer could uh, want to tackle. And, um, and also mentioned something about management teams. And it goes back to what I asked earlier, whether uh, we, we, because we know there are standalone athletes that play esports. And then we know of teams that are globally, even range uh, to all go up to a tune about 5 million US dollars for a team that is only uh, playing esports, you know, the FX team. So what is your take on uh, contracts? And then we can have your reaction. Philip. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Timothy. I won't comment on contracts because I, I, I want to give my time to a gamer. We have a gamer on, on call. Uh, Leon Senyange is actually the one behind the, the event that is going to happen in Kampala. But my, my input is about the perception. When you look at South Africa, they have, un, they have handled it as a mind sport. They compare it to sports like chess. So actually, uh, South Africa, esports is managed under the mind sport South Africa. That's the body managing esports in South Africa. So we need to have our perceptions right. When you look, when you follow the Kenyans who are actively, like the two have gone into, into World Cup, who have qualified for the World Cup event, uh, their training time is regulated, like three hours every day is regulated. So it's a perception issue. Uh, someone has hinted on academies. Kenya already has academies, esport academies. There is one, uh, one of the big ones is East Africa Esports Agency that has an academy specifically put up to train people and manage it as a sport. So it is critical, uh, still it crosses to what uh, David uh, Dennis was saying. Uh, here, like, like he says, when they went to parliament, it was a perception issue. What are we regulating? Is it sport for boxing? Is it e-sport for football? Or is it sport e-sport for gaming? It's, it's also a perception issue. I want to give part of my time to Leon Senyange, if you can call him on call, to give us his, his view as a gamer himself. Thank you. I, I have invited Leo, uh, Leon to speak, but let us just hear from Peter as uh, Leon gets set, and then after that, we can have Leon. Yeah, I, actually, I, I just wanted to add it from one that's why I wanted that invoice. Eh? So that I withdraw the exact amount. Hello? Leon, you can first mute for now. Uh, Peter, you can go ahead. Yes, yes. I just wanted from what Philip was saying, and uh, that being my, my, my part of my, my research uh, on uh, South Africa uh, perspective. Uh, 
as he has said that uh, in South Africa, the 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 the, the, the gamers, uh, they they have a, 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 a an association for 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 for, for gamers and uh, it is also regulated under the mind sports uh, act of south africa and uh, also to add from what uh, i don't know the name dennis who went for the parliament i don't know i don't remember his name uh, yes dennis yeah 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 he was uh, in a bit standing uh, on the fence on whether uh, the, the gamers or the the, the the developers who can uh, who are responsible to uh, for institutionalized esport. But what I know, there have been a lot of numbers of, of uh, organizations who are coming in. For instance, recent uh, last year, uh, the they have been a formation of World Esport Association. Uh, which traces back from World Esport Association, which was funded in 2016. So it is my it is my 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 advice. Maybe in long run, uh, we need to to maybe to connect with this organization at least now to have a a broader picture. Uh, and uh, for me, I don't think if there is any any issue uh, when it comes to to this association, whether it is a gamer or it is someone who is uh, operating the, 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 the games. So, for in terms of association, we, we 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 have the association as of now. As I said, we have where this esports association, which was established last year. And uh, we have also World Esports uh, uh, Association, which came into uh, it was in 2016. And uh, if I can recall, uh, as I've said before uh, on my opening remarks, uh, German being the model, uh, there are some organized teams in German who compete worldwide. Uh, for instance, you might be sitting in Uganda and uh, playing with some 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 teams in, in, in Germany. So I don't see if there is any obstacle. And uh, it is now, uh, uh, as I can say, it is also an opportunity uh, to engage uh, with this uh, organization and this association. So that we can have a very big link, uh, and this, uh, the, we can have a very big link, but also to to to, to grasp some 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 opportunities uh, out of this uh, association. That. All right. Uh, many thanks, Peter, for those insights. Now we have now I have the chance to hear from someone who has played these games online and offline, and we understand that he's organizing a sports event. Leon, please uh, give us your reaction for the day, and if there are any experience that you want to share with us, please do share with us. If you have any question for the panelists, also feel free to give uh, to send those out, and then we'll have our panelists respond to them. Yes, Leon. Yes, you can hear you. Thank you. I'm not Leon, uh, though I got uh, the link to this discussion from Leon. So I think uh, the name reflected there is Leon. Uh, but I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm by the name Ezra Anecho. I, I have been actively involved in esports, both as a player and also currently as an organizer of events and that's how I I have managed to engage and know Leon. Um, one of the panelists mentioned Next Level Experience. Uh, I founded that and uh, uh, I, when I saw the flyer moving around, I felt it's a very good discussion. Uh, our experience has been, um, the Next Level Experience is an esports center we set up here in Uganda. 
and uh, it is making a year uh, this June. So 30th June will be making a year. Uh, so I just want to share our experience and one of the biggest challenges we've faced so far. Our experience has been, of course, uh, as the other panelists have mentioned, um, the, the, the environment of esports is not yet there in, in countries like Uganda. And uh, esports, of course, uh, generally in the community, for, I'll start with the basics. The first challenge is the community. Our community does not yet understand esports. Um, there's a thin line between esports and gaming. Uh, quite a number of people understand gaming, but few understand esports, as well defined by one of the panelists. Esports is competitive gaming. So, and when you move in our communities here in Uganda, you'll find quite a number of uh, gaming places. Uh, but the the esports, the sports element has been quite lacking, and that was one of the main reasons why we decided to take up the mantle to kind of spearhead um, a kind of a silent revolution in esports in the country. Uh, we, 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 when we did our groundwork, there were quite a number of things we found. One is, of course, as I mentioned, the community awareness uh, and the, the, the popularity of gaming is quite higher than the popularity of the esports because uh, uh, you find a, a number of parents buy the gaming for leisure and yet the upside of the competitive aspect is there but because they are not aware that uh, such spaces are not taken up. So the other second challenge, of course, was the level of organization. Um, how organized is the community? Uh, for, 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 for starters, when you looked around, we felt to the, the most common games we have that at least have some level of organization is FIFA. You'll find quite a number of FIFA tournaments here and there. But usually the challenge why we set out for Formula One was uh, unlike FIFA, where usually it's two players, of course, sometimes you can do multiplayer, but in most cases it's two, is that it did bring out the audience very well and it was not so engaging for a wider audience. So, and because it was already there, uh, at least we, we decided that let's choose a game that would be uh, able to engage the wider community. So for us, we went with Formula One. We had a Formula One championship last year. Uh, we, we had quite a number of teams take up, but it was more of a learning experience. Uh, this year, we, 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 uh, we started another competition for the calendar year 2023-2024. And so far, so good. Uh, the audience is picking up, but of course, like, it is a slow pace. So for me, my question and also request to 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 to, to the panelists and the the League of Fraternity is, you know, most cases um, for a young sport like that. Of course, the question we should ask ourselves is, uh, when you look at the legal aspects and uh, the regulations, um, my humble appeal is, let's first have an industry because sometimes the challenge for me, my worry is that. Yes, laws and regulations are good, even at national level, but they can also act as hindrances for new entrants. Because when you're starting, a field is starting like this, and straight away you go into the having strict regulations, you need to have this. The few people who would have attempted to invest uh, in the industry like us to kind of promote now chicken out because it is too airtight and there's no flexibility. Someone wants to organize a tournament, there are national regulations, you have to do ABCD. So it, it, that is for me, but otherwise the organizational level uh, from the Federation is a very welcome idea because now the challenge we have in Uganda is there are very many small, small associations and how do you therefore bring these associations because Esports is broad. Under esports, you will you will have FIFA, which so you start asking yourself the question: If it is FIFA, but played under esports, is it under FIFA or 
that kind of association. Now, like us who are into Formula One, do how do we link with 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 uh, say Federation of Motorsports? And those these questions are actually what drew me close to Leon, because he works with he had work he was doing with Federation of Motorsports, and one of the ideas we shared with them is that actually these esports can be used as a mentorship route. Actually, like us, we have simulators. So when we start training kids at a young age, most of these games are quite realistic. You find the theory of the game and so on is quite fast absorbed by kids at a younger age, and it prepares them for these other sports, the traditional sports, as you'd call them, football and so on, once they have understood. So the, the linkage and bridge is also another aspect that we can leverage on for the people in the esports industry, how do we link with these other traditional kind of sports? Uh, thank you. That is uh, all I wanted to say. All right. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Leon. Uh, I see uh, Andrew's hand is up. Uh, Andrew, any quick reactions? Yeah. A quick one to Ezra uh, using Leon's account. I was hoping that Ezra, Ezra would uh, talk about side effects because uh, this morning while I was doing my last minute preps um, for this for this uh, webinar, I got a download on Ezra and I know that Ezra happens to be a doctor. So I was rather hoping you would tell us about some of the misgivings we have about addictions, eyesight effects from his from his experience as a doctor vis-a-vis -vis, um, someone who is in Timothy. Yes, yes, you you are you are, you had a bit of internet telling, but I think we get it. You, I think your question to Ezra is that from a medical perspective, what are the side effects? And with that medical paper, maybe you could also add what kind, what are they doing if, if they know of any side effects? What are they doing to counter this? I know uh, in places elsewhere, there are guidelines on the menus and uh, on what kind of equipment or safety gear that uh, these players should have. So Ezra, could you help us share on that? Um, thank you. Um, so um, uh, that, that's really a very good uh, uh, when we started out, like I said, we've been kind of doing a groundwork. And uh, of course, one of the things, areas of interest we are looking at is um, how to use esports to nurture talent, like I've mentioned. And when we were planning that, of course, the questions of, 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 of this negative effects came in. And we developed um, a book. Uh, it's called... Um, the Uganda Esports uh, Parent and Care Carers Guide. Uh, why we developed this <clears throat> was in anticipation of 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 such such questions, but also to give a, a balanced view of 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 esports in general, because we realize we are going into spaces like schools and uh, and the communities to kind of create interest in esports. But we didn't want people to, the, these myths that uh, outrightly exist in the community, but also these are, so one of the things, of course, is, as one person mentioned, is the addiction. Addiction is, is a major thing in esports. Gaming is, can be quite addictive. However, uh, for us as a company, that is one of the reasons why we actually tell parents that it's better for to have such companies because I'll give you an example. If you have, you can't regulate how much time, it's hard to regulate how much time your kids are going to spend on a PlayStation. However, if we have the infrastructure, like now the next level experience infrastructure at Akamwesi Mall, it is easier for you as a parent to know how much time your child is going to spend because then just like a pitch, if you had a pitch in your home, you would not know how long a child is playing, how much time they are spending. It, it's a good thing, but they can't play football all the time. 
So therefore, that means you come up with a program and say, every Saturday I'll take you for a few minutes and you play, you practice, then you go away. And vis-a-vis -vis you having it at home installed, and that's that's the, one of the downsides uh, of, of gaming, that esports is regulated. It has some bit of regulation because by structure, you're, you're going to know I'll do this and rest and, and you're able to access all this information. Gaming, on the other hand, is not regulated because if you're a passive gamer, you're going to sit, you reach home, you play. Personally, I used to be a gamer. You would reach home from work, say, at 9 and you play before you know it, it's 2, 3 a.m. And now you haven't had enough sleep. So such, a, of course, like I mentioned, uh, redundancy, uh, overseating, uh, these are not unique, I would say, side effects because when you're working in your office, you will sit for those long hours. But however, because you know that by 5 p.m. I have to get back and go home, you kind of, it's naturally regulated. Vis-a-vis -vis a person, say, who would work from home. If you work from home, the high chances you're also going to, 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 to sit and work for longer hours. Uh, in our book, we also try to to educate the public on some of these issues, the benefits, uh, the challenges, uh, why certain things are important, like diet, the kinds of diet you need to take, the exercise it should be a critical component if you're an esports person. Like now at next level, we have ours as simulators, it's driving. And this driving is close to similar to the driving you have uh, the normal driving that you'd have. The normal driving has side effects. It has side effects that you can knock and the injury is even worse. However, even these normal drivers usually have uh, exercise. Exercise is quite a critical component. So that is in short, that is what I would say that the most important thing for, for industry players like us is to educate and have these things in place that if you're organizing a tournament, you need to have a guideline and educate the players, the carers, the parents, and the community. On the side effects, it should be a well-balanced balanced kind of argument that because you're going to oversee, you need to do this. Because you're going to practice, you, don't, you need to spend a maximum of these hours on the screen get a break then resume later so such practices can only be done if we have documentation for them thank you uh, uh, thanks, may ezra i add something for... oh, okay yeah thank you uh, that was ezra speaking and uh, yeah, i'm glad i shared this because it's a space that uh, both of us have had interest in over a very long period of time my name is leon senyange i am a journalist and just as much a former uh, seven-time co-driver champion in Uganda, rally cars. So that was it with uh, Ronald Sebuguzi? Yes, I've done with the Ronald Sebuguzi, uh, the late Charles Mohanji, Shafiq Semuju, Omar Mayaj, a couple of drivers there in that have uh, won titles with. Um, that kind of world has also thrown me into what we call the, uh, uh, well, the racing and we get competitive around these things. Um, I started playing games about 22 years ago. Now that is, if you take away the, the, the time frame of playing the uh, Super Mario's, uh, in, in the, the, one, the 1D, 2D kind of video games that we had in, in, in the early 90s. So gaming has been part of, um, uh, of, of, of me over, over a period of time. Uh, last year, I, I, um, I, the International Federation of Automobiles, that is the FIA, contacted what they call ASNs or the clubs to organize the uh, FIA Rally, e -sport, Rally Star eSport qualifier. Um, so this involved getting young people under the age of 26, uh, putting them in a simulator, which is um, uh, a simulator give it the picture of a, of a real rally car belted up and it has the effects of the rally car and they had to qualify through uh, that phase the winner from uganda would go to south africa and qualify to become the african or continental uh champion uh currently the qualifiers are going on the global qualifiers are going on so whoever wins the global qualifier will earn themselves a seat 
in a World Rally Championship car for this season 2024 to 2026. Now, that all starts from gaming. That all starts from sitting in a simulator somewhere in Kampala, um, stepping on that pedal and driving what is similar to a rally car, and then you advance. Those are the opportunities that come with the, with the gaming. Um, like several years ago, we also invo um, organized the FIFA championships. Now, these have been going on for several years. Now, the FIFA championships are those that are very popular in, 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 in Uganda, and I believe in Tanzania as well. Tanzania has um, uh, top FIFA players. I'm not so sure about what the, the Kenyans actually do, but what I know is that they have the uh, racing uh, the racing platforms because Ugandan, local, Ugandan drivers have competed online with the Kenyans and the Tanzanians, and uh, that has actually brought some great um, camaraderie within the, the motorsport fraternity across East Africa. These competitors or the drivers or the co-drivers tend to meet uh, in the Afri in the real competitions and you know talk about how they are going to build uh, that platform bigger and that in itself is one of those aspects that uh, esports has uh, you know helped um, uh, competitiveness within motorsport but has it become a profession has it become um, a, a, co a commercialized aspect for us I, I still think we are very far away from that as um, let's say Uganda because of several aspects and Ezra will probably attest to this uh, the technology involved is uh, is quite uh, quite expensive, um, right from the internet to the tools being used. Um, an Xbox tool itself costs over two, what, two million, maybe three million, sometimes five, depending on the generation you have. Uh, a PlayStation, the latest, uh, over six hundred dollars. A simulator is over five thousand to maybe ten thousand uh, dollars in, um, in 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 costing. Can we build the capacity to achieve all those kind of things? Let's say in Uganda, probably yes and probably no. The Kenyans have uh, a, a, an eSport hall. Uh, Uganda, uh, one rally driver created uh, one in um, at Garden City. Ezra has um, the other versions of the simulators or the bucket seats that are used. But then the cost of being able to take part and and you know participate in this kind of things is high for the consumers how and why ezra's is cheaper at um fitidis or what what he calls the um x motion simulator he charges you about uh six dollars for 45 minutes now the excitement of driving a rally car a real rally car a real formula one car in that space means you need to spend over for give or take, um, uh, give or take $24, maybe more in three hours. Do the young people that consume this kind of things have that money? They have to pick it from their parents or otherwise, or in other means. So that also remains a big challenge in terms of uh, how we, far we can go with uh, with the develop, with the growing the esports space. Taxation also remains a big issue for those that can build um, the capacity to create the professionalization. Uh, Ezra will tell you how much money he spends on bringing in a new television, a new simulator seat, a new uh, console. It is quite heavy. Now, the regulations that exist do not, and, and, and like um, the, 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 the legal person from FUFA uh, hinted that the, the, the lawmakers don't understand this space. So for, for you to tell them that machine X that costs ten thousand dollars or slightly less should be tax exempt may not add up so that also remains a problem in trying to to build that spot do we have developers yes uh uganda i have uh, known of some developers uh the clan of kings have developed a game called sunjata trumpet of the last day it is a war game uh how many people in uganda would want to consume this game is it a game that is being consumed locally or should be exported for the continent to be able to play what kind of designs does it have are the designs they are in competitive enough to what a european or an asian will develop those again are aspects that limit some of uh, the growth space for esport in, uh, in, in in probably on the continent the continent though has um, seen growth in er in other areas and other countries south africa egypt uh, those are quite um, have quite a number of developers and uh, game consumers and the competitiveness they're in. So that space has been able to generate uh, the value uh, in terms of money for 
uh, for for Africa, and and I think from the statistics, Africa is ranked uh, fifth or fourth in the continent that are trying to push um, uh, e-sport. Let me talk about the, the the legal aspects, and I think one that this particular um, uh, uh, webinar is about. In Uganda, uh, I think it's Andrew that um, had highlighted the fact that uh, uh, the legislation or the law, the proposed bill for Uganda had aspects around uh, esports. Now, the catch between amateur and professionalism, of course, remains a big challenge because we have not founded, we don't have the foundation. And Ezra hinted on this. He said that we need to first develop the industry to, so as to create regulation around it. Do we have uh, an esports federation in Uganda? Yes, Ezra is, I think, championing this area. But there's so many other uh, pockets of, 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 of associations that, you know, are coming up. Are they with just starting with the National Council of Sports? Is the National Council of Sports requirements they are in? Are they able to fit in? They require nation nationwide um, a nationwide uh, exposure. Are we able to have you know gaming sports in, in northern Uganda, western Uganda, eastern Uganda? The expenses they're in for those that are trying to start up this as a federation could be high. So there's still a lot of work to be done. The opportunities, though, and um, exist uh, in terms of content like andrew had highlighted ip there's quite a lot game developers there are people that need a protection of uh, the, of their properties in this particular spaces the athletes if at any one point we're able to develop uh, professional athletes they'll need the contracts uh, the contracts to be developed for them as well the organizers uh, what are those rules that protect me the participant in a particular competition and maybe the organizers as well a local beverages company several years ago, I think 2011 or 12, organized the competition. That is Mountain Dew. Uh, ironically, I took part in that for the media and, and actually won the Need for Speed competition. It moved across the country. And uh, therein, they were able to, to pick up winners regionally, and then they came for a national competition. Uh, the, the bigger question is, what then happened to those that won the competition? Were they able to be developed further? Uh, or it just ended at that. So there, there's so many aspects around e-sport and its development in this country, but in terms of trying to create regulations, um, there's still a lot of work to do. And importantly, it's trying to help those that um, the lawmakers understand what e-sport is. And on a whole, uh, I believe for the future within the Uganda and the region at whole, as a whole, we'll, we'll have uh, better opportunities going forward when it comes to uh, e-sport. Uh, precisely, that is what I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Leon. Before you before you go off, Leon. Yes. I would, uh, from um, a practical and from your journalistic uh, background, uh, yeah. oh, please tell us. Uh, we 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 heard about e-sports being at the Olympics 2024. Uh, the IOC communicated otherwise. So what's happening there? Should we still be hopeful or this is the end? <laughs> because the connection with the IOC, I, I believe I could be wrong. Of course, we have panelists here who can guide me otherwise. If there's a complete connection between the IOC and esports, I believe then it could answer many questions, including that those that the parliamentarians in Uganda and Dennis have of the international affiliation. So what went wrong? Why did the IOC pull off the esports? And should we have hope or it's done and dusted uh, well uh, as far as i know in the terms of the inclusion of uh, particular sports uh, at, at the olympics it takes a process i think a process of uh, between five to eight years to be able to get a, a particular sport uh, at, uh, at at the olympics uh, and it, it should be a sport that you know is all inclusive uh, a bit of the challenges here in is that the capacities further, let's say on the continent of Africa, are quite different from what you'd have in South Korea or America or even still China. So that limits uh, this sport in, in, in one way or another, or its inclusion uh, at the Olympic in one way or another. But I still believe that um, with the growth in popularity and uh, um, the, the, the more work being done in trying to see how e-sport can be included at the Olympics, uh, there's still room for it. The bigger catch would be what, <clears throat> what particular sport then will they be competing in? Because uh, the South Koreans will tell you they're very good at uh, a game called uh, the League of Legends. Beating a South Korean at that one is definitely a hard one. 
um, uh, beating probably the Americans at uh, a game called um, Call of Duty. They developed it, they play it, they know, they know the ins and outs. They probably even know the cheat codes around these particular games. So being able to beat them uh, at these, uh, at these games um, could be hard. What then does the continent of Africa uh, play? We, we are predominantly FIFA. Yeah. Um, any gaming store, any gaming sport will ask you, will, will, you'll find young people playing FIFA. Uh, and then we have the limited number of those playing, you know, Call of Duty, League of Nations and uh, League of Legends and, you know, Starcraft or Warcraft, you know, Battlefield. So the bigger question would be what game then shall competitors at the Olympics be able to compete at so they can have a leveled playing field. I think for me, that remains the bigger question. And uh, until that is answered by the IOC or even still um, the gaming fraternity, then the inclusion of, uh, of, of games at the Olympics could, uh, could, could come in sooner, maybe 2028. 20, all right, uh, thanks for sharing. I see there are already uh, questions in our Q&A. Some are already being answered by, um, by, uh, by the panelists. Please feel free to uh, send in those. And uh, if, if you want to have the floor, please feel free to put up your hand. We'll be able to pick up on you and uh, uh, allow you to speak at this. But uh, I, would, I would wish to have a reaction from um, our current panelists. Um, According to a website called sportsearnings.com, we have about currently 50 uh, esports players who have earned at least a million and above, and one reportedly earning up to 7 million in his playing career at the age of 27. So in, as things stand, uh, some, uh, of course, Ezra telling us to wait on the regulations, others, uh, Dennis and the team also working to have at least the random law in place, are things done? Do we have, could we be expecting that um, any East African could pull up those runs? It might not be hitting a million US dollars, but could pull up to, because we have, uh, take it a little bit, we have uh, uh, very huge numbers of, of unemployment. And then we have on, on this end and on the other end, we have people earning up to a million US dollars from playing games. Yet we also, also have people who play games. So as things stand, could you see anything uh, where any, any East African in the region could um, uh, earn as much as we see from uh, the reports from sports, sportsearnings.com. Maybe I can first listen from uh, Phil and then the rest. If you have any other questions, please feel free to uh, put up your hand or you can put them in the chat and then we'll respond to them there or on, uh, on the floor. Yes, uh, Philip. Thank you, Dennis. I think that's an answer that is in the affirmative. If you have followed the Kenyan professional gamers, uh, the speed at which they are moving, uh, like I said, there's one already who is going to, to, to play in the 2023 FIFA games. Uh, Dennis also put, uh, put a comment in the chat uh, stating that the IOC is organizing the Olympics Esports Week, which is actually June, this very June. There's the World Esports Championships late in August. And uh, in November, we have the Esports Games in that... Uh, and all these games have Kenyan participants looking at them. So the question of an East African earning that amount is, is largely in the affirmative. Thank you. All right, thank you. We also have a question in, in the chat. Uh, Philip has uh, tackled that, but I'll just bring that to the floor where they ask if there is there any project law on esports in the East African community? Peter, is this something that you want to react to? Uh, no, I just wanted to add on the Olympic uh, and the Philip was uh, just hinted. Uh, and uh, this was the last one from uh, Leon. Uh, I understand in June 23rd and 22nd or 23rd, there will be a, a Olympic eSport Olympic week in Singapore. And uh, basically, this is organized by Olympic uh, 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 Olympic. Uh, so for uh, it was just a lesson from Leon that uh, 
this uh, e-sport has now uh, with time getting recognition from uh, this international sports uh, organization including uh, uh, olympic uh, I, I know he hinted about the the olympic and the, the issue maybe it might take time but i can assure him uh, e-sport is now global and it is taking recognition from olympic itself and that's why we have a, a week for uh, eSport Olympic in Singapore on June. All right, we have uh, Andrew's hand up also. Uh, thank you, Timothy. I just wanted to react to the question you posed if it is possible for someone from the region to earn those lots of money that uh, is being earned by other e gamers uh, across the divide. I think for me it is very possible. The most important thing is the the, the, the environment around eSport needs to become more acceptable. If we have a, a swift and a, a, if we have a change, where there is acceptability towards esport as a profession, then it's very, very possible. It's very possible because it's not for lack of players. Uh, I'm sure when you when you're passing the, the nearest trading market where you live, I'm sure you find uh, a shop somewhere where there there is all the people where, where kids actually are going to pay five shillings maybe to 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 play for about. Uh, the environment needs to accept that this is a there's a, a, a change towards that um kind of um sport and and it is lucrative thank you all right uh thanks for that like i said if you have any question that you wish to uh, to take to the panelists uh, please put up your hand or put it in the chat but just to react more on uh, ambrose's question on the east african community now, for what I can gather is that at least uh, Article 119 of the East African community gives the partner states the competence to deal with anything sport. But uh, uh, in a, so that means that the countries, uh, if they, they can come together, evidently from the Pamoja bid uh, uh, that has been just uh, submitted by uh, Tanzania, Kenya, and uh, Uganda, Similarly, they can come together under the ESC framework and do anything that they want to do with sport. They, have, they are competent enough to do that. Something similar that they have done under the East African Community Customs Management Act, and something maybe Leon and Ezra would want to know, is that uh, under that act, East African Community Customs Management Act, that uh, we normally uh, phrase as IACMA, they permit member states to allow the importation uh, of of sports equipment qualified sports equipment at no or at very subsidized taxes so i know at least they have done that so if you're importing any kind of sports equipment to be used you can uh, exploit that provision if the partner states still feel like they want to do something more the law permits them to do anything more if uh, let me just confirm if we have no other further questions or reactions but uh, in the meantime, we can uh, prepare to have the closing remarks from our panelists. I we can begin with uh, Peter, and then we can go to Andrew, um, and then we will close with our with our chairman. Yeah, for for me, uh, I think we have exhausted a lot, and uh, it has been a very good. Uh, insightful uh, session and uh, what I can say from the gamers, the lawyers and uh, whoever is interested in eSports, uh, opportunities are abundant and uh, as Africans uh, we need to snatch and uh, do uh, a run uh, to harness the, the opportunity. And uh, if we, we leave it alone uh, to, to other guys, then we'll be the spectators 
uh, within the the, the, the esports and the, the industry itself. So it is my 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 uh, advice. We lawyers who are interested and uh, who are passionate to, to be part in the, uh, of this industry, uh, let us work together. And uh, it is now a call for, for we East African lawyers to work together, uh, sharing our expertise and uh, sometimes engaging the gamers uh, and uh, to have a, 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 a fair playing field for from our our, our countries and uh, I'm sure there is a promising future and uh, we need uh, to, to run because uh, I can tell you time is not on, on our best ally uh, given the fact of the challenge uh, uh, for me I see challenge is also an opportunity uh, given the fact, uh, looking at the history and the evolving of esports from COVID, it was COVID which was a challenge, but it, it is a challenge which gave opportunity, and it is where the esport came in and uh, 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 spread the uh, abundant. So it is right time now for for, for us uh, to be part of it. And, but also to connect. Uh, I've seen some some colleagues, uh, Philip, uh, Andrew. So it is right now for us to to connect and uh, be part of evolving uh, and the promising industry and the sports like esports. That's for me. All right, uh, maybe we have uh, a question for Marlene that uh, maybe we can handle before we have we close out on our eight minutes, just to widen more on uh, the IP and sport. Now, you would want to know that the main commercial arm of uh, general sport, be it uh, the European Premier League, the Champions League, Formula One, tennis, basketball, is the IP in the products that, that uh, these sports entities create? Could be in the merchandise, whether it's in the shirt sales or any the footballs themselves or anything, but mainly it's the broadcasting rights. Now, the, these broadcasting rights are all protected by IP. Firstly, in the granting of the rights, and if there is any recording or production of those rights, then in the copyright in whatever production comes out of uh, those particular uh, sports events. Uh, so they sell out, they, they can collectively, for example, if you have the AFCON 2027, you can collectively sell it out to one, one or two people to broadcast that. So that is all intellectual property. Narrowing it down more on, uh, on uh, esports. Now, these sports, uh, esports events, you may want to know that they're also streamed live. And uh, these people who stream them also have the broadcasting rights. And of course, when they record them, then they have the copyright in those broadcasting rights. That is a big cash cow for them. And like we said, as they are being played, they are advertisers on screen that you see on screen, as if, if, as if you're watching any other ordinary Ghana Premier League uh, game or a CAF Confederations final. You would see the billboards on the sides. So all those are uh, uh, the, the rights to, um, to, to advertise on that end. And then when, when what, people advertise with along uh, are mainly their trademarks. For example, we may have seen uh, the famous map of EA Sports, or if it's Xbox, all those things have their particular trademarks. So all that is IP. And then for the real equipment, it has the build. Now that is an industrial design, which is also part of the IP that is involved in uh, sports. Let's have um, Andrew. Uh, Timothy, thank you very much. Just to add on to what you said, even the game, uh, the developers of the various games are protected by copyright law because uh, you've authored something that is widely used and that is why you find most organizers of esports activities, um, first, the first person they contract is the, the author of the game because it is the author of the game who can only give them a 
who, who can give them the license to utilize the, their creation for purpose of, of, of the sport. Uh, as a wrap up, uh, Timothy, I, I am grateful that we've had this opportunity to discuss esport in, in, in the general terms. Um, I am hoping that, uh, because I'm very sure, just like Kalen out there, there are several other lawyers who still haven't appreciated where the opportunities are for, for lawyers. I'm hoping that uh, over time when we shall organize another, another, another of these webinars that uh, has um, where we are discussing aspects, for instance, of IP that are associated with esports. You mentioned trademark, you mentioned um, industrial designs and the likes. It would be important for us to cast more light into those aspects of IP that interplay with, with esports. And, and there we can build uh, the fandom uh, of this, of this um, area of practice even more. Thank you very much, Timothy. Thank you uh, for, thank you, Gabriel, for hosting us, and Timothy for the able moderation, plus all the panelists. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Andrew, for sharing. Just, just add a bit of it. We know if you go to the IP in the sports, it's also another session of its own. But uh, what maybe just add a bit of thought for what Andrew was sharing. Now, these are mainly, these esports are mainly backed up by softwares that make all this happen. So depending on, the, on where you are, for example, in Uganda, we classify software as copyright, but you may go to another country where that software is patentable. Now, when you go to patents, I know it's all this technology, but as a lawyer, I would want to interest yourself in how further they protect these, uh, the IP in the softwares, mainly looking at copyright and patent, or some that don't qualify as patents, then they can go for what they call as uh, utility models or simple patents, depending on the country in which you are. Okay, we can have a wrap up from our chairman. And uh, a vote of thanks to our, our panelists who will all still be given by our EBO chairman. Yes, fellow. Thank you, thank you very much. I see the host sun is also up, but we'll come to that. Uh, I can't stop. Uh, thanking everyone who is on call. Uh, the panelists have presented something very good, uh, sensitive and attractive to members that have been on call. I, I will not stop calling upon people whenever I, they see these flyers coming up. These sports law sessions, I think, are one of the most attended sessions at, of ELS, I believe so. Uh, this topic and more will still be discussed in July. Uh, 13th, 14th, uh, Advocate Peter will be uh, a panelist at the Sports Law Conference organized by Vinare, Vinare Legal Chambers, Tanzania. Uh, I think we can also work together with uh, Gabriel Achaye to see how ELS members can benefit in that conference, more so those who have interest in this particular uh, sector of law. Uh, otherwise, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Timothy. I pass the mic back to you. Yes, we'll hear from uh, Gabriel, our main host from uh, the ELS Secretariat. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Timothy. Uh, my chairperson, Mr. Philip Monabi, our distinguished uh, panelists, Mr. Andrew Oluka, Mr. Peter Mukandi, and to you, Mr. Timothy Kaja, would like to express our sincere gratitude in uh, taking off time uh, to uh, be part of this session. We are indeed humbled uh, by your presentation. I must say the session has been quite informative. Uh, there's quite a lot that I was listening to and picking out areas of uh, intervention and uh, possible uh, uh, activities for the sports law committee. So I thank you. Uh, to our participants, uh, this would not have been possible without your presence. We would like to thank you on behalf of the East Africa Law Society Secretariat for taking off time uh, to be part of this session. I'm, I'm sure that you have uh, uh, learned quite a lot about esports within the region. 
And uh, I would like to also take this very opportunity uh, to invite you uh, for uh, legislative drafting uh, training, which is organized by the East Africa Law Society. And this will be held on the 3rd to the 7th of July in Arusha, Tanzania. So if you are uh, an advocate that is keen on legislative drafting, you can visit our website to get more details about this uh, training session. But also we have sent out individual emails uh, to each of you uh, relating to the session and also on our WhatsApp platforms. Uh, secondly, I would like to also take an, this opportunity to, again to invite you for the in-house council convention. Uh, it's a first of its kind. It's organized uh, uh, and it's scheduled to take place on the 27th and 28th of July in Zanzibar. And this will be the biggest gathering of uh, practitioners in the field of East Africa uh, in-house council practice. Again, that information has been relayed on uh, our website. And uh, if you're interested, kindly uh, 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 register to attend uh, the same. We'll be happy to host you. Again, I would like to finally remind you that our 28th East Africa Law Society Annual Conference and General Meeting will be taking place on the 22nd to the 25th of November in Burundi, Pujumbura. Kindly save the date. And I look forward to seeing you all at these trainings. I wish you all a very fruitful afternoon. Uh, we have prepared uh, certificates for each of our training sessions, and we'll be sharing with you a report of the webinar session. It will be in form of a recording uh, of the webinar session, and also it will be accompanied by a report. So we thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to your active participation and uh, feel free to reach us on our website, on our email and telephone contacts in case you need any further information. So I thank you so much, Timothy and Tim, and to you, the participants. Have a lovely afternoon. Over to you, Timothy. All right, it's just two minutes past uh, four, East African time. Uh, thank you all to our panelists. Thank you to our, our attendees. We're very glad to have you, and we look forward to having more of this. Bye-bye for now.